This segment of WGCU's Untold Stories is underwritten by Lee County Government, County Commission, Ding Darling Wildlife Society, Sanibel Captiva Community Bank, Century 21 J.B. Novelli International. His pen and sketchpad earned him two Pulitzer Prizes. He was a friend and confidant to presidents, from Theodore Roosevelt to Harry Truman. He was a pioneer in the American conservation movement, almost single-handedly building the National Wildlife Refuge System. He helped prevent rampant development from gobbling up pristine Sanibel Island on Florida's southern Gulf Coast. And every time a flock of seabirds takes flight Above the wildlife sanctuary that bears his name, the legacy of J. Norwood Ding Darling is sketched in bold strokes across the southern sky. He was at least a hundred years ahead of his time. His cartoons were both political and conservation oriented, and he had some strong viewpoints on the political things that were going on in the early part of last century. If you go back and look at the cartoons that he drew in uh, the early 1900s, you find that he was dealing with and covering the same problems that we're still dealing with now 100 years later. Many people credited Darling with being prescient, that is that he could foresee the future. And uh, he would say nonsense, that uh, all you had to do was be a student of history to be able to figure out what's gonna happen next. It is impossible to tell the story of the J.N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge without also telling the story of the man for whom it is named. J. Norwood Darling was born in 1876 in remote northern Michigan. His middle name came from his birthplace, Norwood. His father was a Methodist minister who had fought for the Union in the Civil War. When he was 10, his family joined the country's westward migration. Darling's early life was certainly not privileged. His uh, father was a, a minister. Uh, he was, uh, the father was opening a new congregation on the frontier. This would have been in the uh, late 1800s in Iowa along the Missouri River and uh, Darling had no privileges when he grew up. He's the son of a minister doesn't have much money, but he did have a good education. After a less than stellar academic career, Darling, something of a maverick, graduated from Beloit College in Wisconsin in 1900 with an eye on a career in medicine. But the seeds of his conservationist future were planted by a professor who instilled in him a sense that all living things Plants, animals, humans are inexorably interconnected by the soil, water, and air that they share. To earn money for medical school, he returned to Sioux City and took a job as a cub reporter. But fate has something other than a medical degree in mind for young Jay Darling. He had no intention of becoming an illustrator or a cartoonist until when he had his first job as a newspaper reporter he was given a job to uh, take a picture of a distinguished gentleman in Sioux City, Iowa, who uh, did not want his picture taken. And uh, Deng, the young cub reporter, went to take the picture and the fellow was offended and he chased uh, Darling away, uh, waving his cane at uh, Darling. And uh, so Darling, the only thing he could do in lieu of the picture was to go back and sketch this gentleman's picture, which he did, and it ran in the newspaper, and Darling's career as a cartoonist was born. He adopted the pen name Ding, a contraction of his last name, which had been a nickname in college, and started drawing. His career soared 
Darling was an extraordinary individual. He had an amazing ability and he had the forum, uh, being that he was a, a, a political cartoonist or editorial cartoonist for the Des Moines Register, but he was syndicated through 120 different newspapers across the country. So he had an extraordinary ability to reach people. And at that time period, most of those editorial cartoons appeared in the newspapers right there on the front page. It was an era before TV. It was an era before radio a lot, in a lot of cases. And so everybody looked to get their news and their information from the local papers. And if you had a Ding Darling cartoon on that front page, um, you knew something big was going on. He was an amazing man and had a profound effect on the general public. Darling skewered everyone and everything, from corporate greed to pompous politicians to big spending government. He railed in pen and ink against war, bigotry, crime, and racial hatred. He might lambaste a president on one issue, then praise him the next day on another. His cartoons on conservation and wildlife alone filled the volume. In all, he penned more than 15,000 cartoons, winning Pulitzer Prizes in 1924 and again in 1942. He was arguably the best known cartoonist and one of the most influential people in the nation. But it is likely that the man least impressed by Ding Darling was Ding Darling himself. He was a very modest man and he would say that he probably never changed anybody's mind uh, with one of his cartoons. But in fact, I, I think we'd all agree that, that know his career and uh, the things that went on during his career would say that he probably did influence people's thoughts. Nor did he consider himself an artist. It's surprising to me that if you ask Darling how he identified himself, he was a newspaper man. He was a journalist. He wasn't a cartoonist. He wasn't a conservative. He was a journalist. And he took great pride in that. Nearing 60, Darling's health was in decline. So he did what so many Northerners do. He sought relief in the curative magic of Florida's tropical climate, traveling from Iowa in one of those newfangled travel trailers he dubbed Bouncing Betsy. It was in about 1935, and Darling had a bad uh, case of bronchitis. And his, his home was in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, with pretty severe winters. And he was uh, a lot of respiratory problems with those severe winters. So he was looking for a warmer climate place to spend part of the winter. And he ventured to uh, Captiva Island, which was pretty remote in those days. Darling took to his southern retreat like one of his beloved ducks to water. By 1942, he'd constructed an elevated fish house on pilings at the end of a long dock in the waters off Captiva. I was lucky enough as a boy to spend a few winters there and it was remarkable. You could look down from the house, uh, the, the uh, balcony that ran around the, uh, around the house, you could look down through the water and see all the life on the bottom of the bay. See the horseshoe crabs and the stingrays and the fish. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful place for a kid to uh, spend a little time. But unlike many northern snowbirds, Darling hadn't come to Florida to play. And what made his fish house unique was his method of warding off unwanted intrusions. Darling was a hard-working guy when he was down here. It wasn't as though he was on vacation. He drew at least one cartoon every day, and he was very active down here. Uh, so he wasn't on vacation. And when he wanted to work, he was always pestered by friends and admirers. So at the fish house, he built a drawbridge in this dock. And when he didn't want to be disturbed, he would pull up the drawbridge and work in peace and quiet in the fish house. While Darling's career was flourishing, Sanibel and Captiva Islands were still remote, isolated, and relatively underpopulated. Well, it was a wonderful place to live. There were no paved roads, no sidewalks, no, no movie theater, no uh, hardware store, no, uh, anything like that, drugstore, movie house. 
when five o'clock came, if you didn't have a small boat or somebody, you were here. And the mosquitoes were so thick that at night you had to park your way like that to, to, to get to your car. You drive down the road with both doors open, try to keep it out of there. Wake up in the morning, your screen was black with mosquitoes. But as the old boy said, if you don't know no better, you can't, you're there. That's the way we were. We didn't know any better, and so we were happy. But trouble was brewing in paradise. The islands were beginning to be noticed by developers with dollar signs in their eyes. Before they could strike, however, they ran into a formidable foe. Standing well over six feet, Darling had a robust build, a deep, booming voice, and a sharp mind. He was an articulate writer and an eloquent speaker. But he had something else going for him as well. He was very straightforward. He didn't deal in shades of truth. It was either black or it was white, and he didn't mind telling you which he thought it was. Uh, I never saw Darling wrestle with a, any question of ethics. Uh, faced with a decision uh, that had any ethical connotations of being right or wrong, there was never any hesitation, whether it was a decision that worked in his favor or against him. Uh, he, he always went for the truth. Using all of his resources, Darling began mobilizing opposition to the Sanibel development plans. Darling first stepped foot here on Sanibel and Captiva Islands in the late 1930s. And at that time, developers were going to purchase this land, which is now the refuge, for 25 cents an acre. Uh, Darling and many other, other residents really didn't want that to happen. So they fought the developers that were wanting to do that and really were able to get it originally established as a state wildlife refuge. Later in 1945, he prodded President Truman to purchase lands here on Sanibel, which created the Sanibel National Wildlife Refuge. In the 1960s, a series of land swaps with the state expanded the refuge and brought it under federal ownership rather than a lease. There wasn't much there in those early days. The Fish and Wildlife Service used the old Sanibel Lighthouse for administrative offices and staff housing. I lived at the Sanibel Lighthouse because I had to uh, live there as a condition of my employment. And I lived there for 22 years and we had no neighbors and uh, it was a great lifestyle. We had to drink rainwater that fell out of the sky and it was all part of island life and something that we really appreciated. The first manager of the refuge was a colorful pilot named Tommy Wood, who used a seaplane to conduct bird counts when the terrain was still largely inaccessible. He got the job thanks in large measure to support from Ding Darling. Tommy Wood applied for the position, came to Sanibel, and from all indications and everything I've heard, uh, Ding Darling just fell in love with Tommy Wood. Tommy was a unique person. He was one of a kind in one of the characters that Sanibel is lacking today. He was legendary. He, uh, he knew everyone, he loved everyone, and he definitely w wanted the, uh, the Sanibel ethic that uh, Ding Darling had started to continue. In the early 1960s, what is now Wildlife Drive and the Indigo Trail were built as mosquito control dikes. Eventually, they became well-traveled paths bringing visitors to the refuge within handshake range of multiple species of wildlife. The refuge was originally established to protect migratory birds, but we really have all kinds of wildlife here that we're protecting uh, and in some cases restoring habitat for, uh, such as uh, we have American crocodile, probably the northernmost American crocodile in the United States. We also have alligators, raccoons, river otters. We're known for our birds. We're rated by Birders World magazines and others as one of the top bird watching destinations in the country. And it's for that reason that this refuge really exists. In 1982, the administration center was built and operations moved out of the lighthouse. In 2001, a new three and a half million dollar visitor center opened with exhibits, gift shop, classrooms, lecture hall, and a reproduction of Darling's studio. The refuge, what it encompasses today, 
is a lot more than just habitat. We bring in a lot of school programs. We have school groups that come to our education center. The main purpose for that Ding Darling Education Center is to educate people on the Southwest Florida environment and the conservation efforts of Ding and our predecessors here on the island. So this refuge has a huge component of visitor services, environmental education, not to mention the wildlife biology and research that goes on here as well. As important and impressive as the buildings and the services are, it is the critters, a walking, swimming, crawling, slithering, flying cornucopia of wildlife that draws the visitors. Some 800,000 strong flock to this wild wonderland each year, pumping as much as $70 million into the region's economy. Ding Darling is one of 540 National Wildlife Refuges, a network created in 1900 by Theodore Roosevelt, but dramatically expanded by Darling himself during his tenure as head of the National Biological Survey. It encompasses 6,400 acres, almost half of which are set aside as federal wilderness area where no building, no development, no motorized vehicles are permitted. With a full-time staff of 17, an annual operating budget of two and a half million dollars, and some 250 volunteers, Ding Darling is one of 20 in the system to be designated premier wildlife refuges. In 2004, Hurricane Charlie ripped through southwest Florida, causing extensive damage to the facilities at the Ding Darling Refuge and requiring major repairs. Perhaps even worse, in order to avert flooding at Lake Okeechobee, massive amounts of polluted fresh water were released into the Caloosahatchee River, producing huge blooms of blue-green algae across the region's estuaries, including the once pristine refuge. The refuge over the last few years has gone through some dark and deep problems in terms of ecologically speaking. Everything from Hurricane Charlie to uh, some of the effects from uh, freshwater flows as well as from, from uh, water quality problems that have created huge algae, um, uh, algae blooms that have smothered seagrasses. Those things we don't take lightly and we have to pay attention to them. A stroll through the Ding Darling Refuge offers some apparent anomalies. Birders peering through binoculars and camera lenses to zero in on their winged quarry stand elbow to elbow with anglers casting their lines upon the waters. And Darling, an avid hunter and fisherman, succeeded in having hunting and shooting banned on Sanibel and Captiva. A contradiction? Ding Darling's grandson doesn't think so. Darling was not a preservationist for preservationist's sake. Darling really believed that the sort of the root of all evils was the unwise use of natural resources. He believed that the, the great civilizations of the world had all failed. If you analyzed it, they'd all failed when they'd used up their natural resources. And that goes back through all time. Uh, so he wanted to use our resources wisely. What was it that sprouted those seeds planted by that biology professor back at Beloit College? What transformed young newspaper man Jay Darling into a crusading conservationist? Darling, as a very young boy, had uh, moved from his home in Michigan to uh, the frontier, Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, in the summertime, when he got a little older, he used to go back and work on his uncle's farm. Uh, each year that he went back, he could see the deterioration in the soil and uh, the, the environment. Uh, it, it was something being absent. He could see the change more readily than those who were there every day and, and saw the change more gradually. It's then when he became interested in conservation. The clincher may have been an eye-opening trip back to the farm in Michigan to represent the family at his uncle's funeral. It was the first time I had seen my youthful paradise since I was about 15 years old, and it seemed as if the farm had died with Uncle John. Jay Norwood 
Ding Darling. The rich soil had been stripped away by erosion, the forests logged out, and what had once been a vibrant stream was but a muddy trickle devoid of game fish. The well was dry, the orchard a mass of tangled brush and stumps, and the lone crow the only wildlife to be seen. This was my first conscious realization of what could happen to land, what could happen to clear running streams, what could happen to bird life and human life when the common laws of Mother Nature were disregarded. J. Norwood Ding Darling. Darling did not confine his activism to the cloistered confines of his drawing studio. In the early 1930s, he was urged to seek the Republican nomination to the U.S. Senate from Iowa, but opted instead to retain the independence and income of his cartooning career. Darling chaired the Iowa Fish and Game Commission and was founder and first president of the National Wildlife Federation. In 1934, during the first administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt, he was appointed head of the National Bureau of Biological Survey, the forerunner of the National Fish and Wildlife Service. He resigned that post in November 1935, but not before launching one of the world's most successful conservation programs. The Federal Duck Stamp Program was a program that was set aside for land acquisition. Darling needed money to purchase these lands so that the wildlife would not be exploited, so that we control hunting pressures, uh, and, and so that they had habitat to, to, uh, to breed in uh, and to migrate to. Well, in 1934, uh, Roosevelt said, listen, we can't give you all the money to do what you need to do. You need to find ways, other ways of raising this money. So he devised the, the duck stamp program, the migratory bird stamp, at which all hunters of migratory birds, waterfowl, have to purchase the stamp. He designed the first stamp, then personally bought the first one sold. To date, the program is credited with preserving some five million acres of habitat and raising more than two billion dollars after the numbers are adjusted for inflation. Despite the unparalleled success of the program, Darling was outraged with the proposal to honor him on a duck stamp. One time the federal government wanted to put Ding Darling's uh, portrait on a stamp and he said, I don't look like a duck and I don't want that. So. Uh, I think the point was is that, you know, this wasn't about him and this is the way he saw things. It was about the resource and that's how passionate uh, uh, Ding Darling really was. For that matter, his grandson suspects that Darling might not have been too thrilled when the Sanibel Wildlife Refuge was renamed after him in 1967, five years after his death. He wouldn't have gone for it. I, <laughs> Darling would not have uh, would have been the last one to approve the I idea of naming a refuge after him. He uh, he was a very modest guy, and uh, he uh, he didn't he didn't take credit. For, he didn't like to take credit for things. Uh, he was very self-effacing in that way. A half century of serving as the conservation conscience for a nation didn't dim Ding Darling's passion. But an observation he made when he was in his early 80s suggests it did leave him just a little cynical about the fickle, fleeting consciousness of the American public. I am learning one thing the hard way, and that is that you have to re-educate the public mind about every 15 or 20 years, or it forgets everything it learned a while back. J. Norwood, ding darling. He needn't have worried at least not on Sanibel Island where his legacy shines bright and certainly not at the J.N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge where the birds still roost and the re-education process never stops. Good. You are telling the public, the visitor, whoever comes, about the area in which they are. Maybe it's special because of a plant or it's special because of an animal there. You're interpreting the landscape. 
when you see a group of manatees uh, off of the wildlife drive and, and, and you see visitors actively engaged and, it, and you see that light click, um, that's really uh, the stories that I like to hold on to and hold close to me is it really clicks with them and they get it. They really understand why refuges and wildlife are important. J. Norwood Ding Darling died on February 12, 1962. The following morning, the Des Moines Register carried his last cartoon on page one. In typical Ding Darling fashion, he had sketched his own epitaph. To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU-produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1-888-824-0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Call or visit our website at WGCU.org.